Move. How a stationary spot on the ground shows where you're headed. With the airplane trimmed for approach speed and the descent rate constant, as you look through your windscreen, there will always be one single spot on the ground directly ahead of you that doesn't appear to move. It's the spot where your airplane is headed, assuming that the glide path doesn't change, of course. All objects on the surface positioned above the stationary spot and thus beyond the point where the glide path intercepts the runway appear to move up away from that stationary spot as you get closer. Those below the stationary spot appear to move down and away from that spot. The points above and below the stationary spot appear to move away because the entire surface picture in your windscreen is getting bigger. Look at the center of any picture hanging on a wall while moving closer to the center of that picture. The center remains stationary while the upper and lower parts of the picture appear to move up and down away from the center. We call this technique for evaluating your glide path the stationary spot method. Now, after turning on to final approach, I don't want you to look for the spot on the ground that isn't moving. Instead, I want you to look at the spot where you'd like to land, your desired landing spot, and see whether or not it's moving up or down relative to your windscreen. If the spot where you'd like to land remains stationary in your windscreen, then that's where you're headed, and good for you. As a final note on slips, keep in mind that a slip begins with a slip, not a skid. That's why it's always best to initiate a slip with aileron usage first, followed by rudder. Aileron application banks the airplane and yaws the nose in the opposite direction of the turn, which fits the technical definition of a slip. As the nose yaws, the appropriate amount of opposite rudder pressure is added to either perform a forward or a side slip. Some pilots start their slips by applying rudder first and induce a temporary skid before the slip. Now this is a very poor technique because it's dangerous if performed too close to the wing's critical angle of attack. After all, a skid at the moment of a stall is how you enter a spin. So apply aileron pressure, then follow it with the appropriate application of rudder. The Runway Expansion Effect Hello folks, Rod Machado here. What if I could show you how to identify when to begin the round out and flare for landing in a way that doesn't rely on depth perception? Have I got your attention? <laughs> Good. Let's discuss the technique that we'll call the Runway Expansion Effect. As we learned in an earlier video, when you approach the runway in a stabilized descent, its trapezoidal shape appears to grow in the windscreen. The rate of growth, however, isn't linear. It turns out that the width of the runway near your selected landing spot appears to expand geometrically in the windscreen with the largest amount of growth occurring when you're 8 to 10 seconds from touchdown. In fact, during the period from 12 seconds to 8 seconds prior to touchdown, the runway width at your selected landing spot appears to expand 10 times in size. Looking at the runway lateral expansion versus time to touchdown graph, you can see how the rate of runway expansion is the largest when you are 8 to 10 seconds away from touching down. And this expansion also occurs at a point where the airplane is typically around 10 feet above the landing surface. Said another way, the runway dramatically widens in your windscreen right at the point where you should typically begin the round out followed by the landing flare. Now that is very convenient. You can learn to better perceive objects in your periphery with training. And that is exactly what your flight instructor has learned to use and come to rely on to land the airplane. He's learned to use his peripheral vision to aid in evaluating his height above and closure rate with the runway during the landing flare. Now, as a student pilot, you don't have the experience to do that. So you have to learn to use a different method at first to land because you're unable to use your peripheral vision in the way your flight instructor does. That's why student pilots should use the landing technique that I call the find the planet strategy. Here's how it works. 
As you begin the round out, you should shift your visual focus to the left side of the engine cowling to a triangular shaped viewing area bordered by the left side of the windscreen, the distant horizon, and the left side of the engine cowling. That's right. You can actually see the horizon to the left side of the engine cowling, despite the fact that it disappears when looking directly over the airplane's nose during the landing flare. Amazing, right? The geometry of this area is shaped like a slice of pizza, which I call the domino effect, and in it you'll see the left side of the runway as well as a small slice of the distant horizon. Congratulations, you've just found planet Earth again, evoking what I call the, hey, there it is response. Now your job is to find, then look at a spot on the runway that appears to be stationary. It's the same spot you see ahead of you while driving on the freeway that just loses its blurry features and appears to become stationary because it's far enough ahead of you. Now at most approach speeds in an airplane, this is typically located at about 80 to 100 feet ahead of the airplane. This non-moving, non-blurry spot allows you to assess your height above and vertical closure rate with the runway. Keep in mind that, perceptually speaking, the non-moving or non-blurry spot on the runway will shift towards you as the airplane slows down. Therefore, your runway focal point moves closer to the cockpit as the airplane decelerates during the landing flare. And this is how you accurately keep track of your height and closure rate with the runway. If you're attempting to steer an airplane with your feet and find that you are over-controlling, then try pulsing the rudder pedals to stop the serpentining motion. Instead of applying continuous pressure on the rudder pedal, simply apply a pulse to one pedal. In other words, quickly push it in and release the pressure. Then watch the results. You'll find that this is an effective way to stop the airplane's lateral movement during taxi takeoff or landing. Here's a practical example. The aircraft begins serpentining to the left. A right rudder pulse is applied to straighten it out. Another right rudder pulse is applied to return to the center line, and a left rudder pulse aligns the aircraft with the center line. Now, the intent of the rudder pulse is not to supplant the use of normal rudder. It's only intended to correct for serpentining action when normal rudder pressure doesn't seem to do the job for you. There is, however, a very interesting technique that experienced pilots use to help them maintain the precise elevator back pressure necessary to produce a smooth landing. Known as sampling the response, this technique allows them to precisely control the airplane's rate of closure with the runway, thereby minimizing the chance of over or under flaring the airplane. Here's how it's done. During the flare, Apply continuous elevator back pressure, but do so in small pull and release motions. For instance, the wavy green line in this graph represents the tiny pull release motions on the yoke that are used to maintain the threshold of pitch control during the landing flare. And this means that the slight pull and release motions on the yoke allows you to sense the threshold at which additional pull results in the nose attitude raising, thus allowing you to maintain the airplane in the precise attitude desired for the landing flare. Think about pulling just far enough aft so that the nose would begin to rise beyond the desired pitch attitude if you pulled even a tiny bit more. As you hold the elevator in this position, you've technically arrived at a point that I call the threshold of control, a point at which pulling further would raise the nose. But as we've just discussed, this threshold is always moving elevator aft as you slow down. So you have to keep sampling the elevator response to maintain that threshold of control. 